and not so much needed. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of the Holy Scriptures. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, they would become not just signs on a page, but channels of grace into our hearts. We pray this for your level, loving and merciful namesake. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right, so we uh, finished uh, kind of, a, like, you know, kind of in my mind, I'm just, you know, I'm still in the school <coughs> system. I just can't get out of it. So we had the spring semester, right? So we had a short summer break, you know, and then I'm back into the fall semester now. Uh, starting a little bit earlier, we can think of this as like an S term, you know. Uh, but uh, so we're kind of, we finished with chap Matthew chapter 12 and heading into Matthew chapter 13. And so again, the, uh, so the kind of the format being that uh, we're doing unheard words or words that do not appear on the, in the Sunday lectionary. So even if hypothetically you had three years of perfect attendance on all Sundays, you would still never hear these passages of the Gospels, unless, of course, you read the Bible on your own, which is a commendable <laughs> practice. <laughs> um, but, right, so, uh, so in Matthew 13 is, is, the, is, the, famous, uh, is the famous chapter of parables. It's like you get the parables of the kingdom. And so Jesus tells, you know, parable to parable to parable to parable, the whole chapter. And, it and it's really a... It comes in be, being it's, all, it's almost smack dab right in the middle of the narrative uh, of Matthew's narrative, so that should indicate that this is, comes at a critical juncture in Jesus's ministry. So in chapter twelve, what we saw was the opposition to Jesus and the rejection of his message starting to build. The, the, <coughs> message, the, the rejection of Jesus's mission, even in Galilee, even in Galilee is starting to build. And so the parables are coming in at that, precisely that point as Jesus is about to, in Luke's God, one of my favorite phrases from Luke is to, you know, to turn his face to Jerusalem. You know, he's about to make that southern turn and start walking to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But instead, but still he has some parables to share in Galilee, which will help explain what's about to happen. It helps explain what's coming immediately before and what will follow after. So what you don't hear, you actually, in the lectionary, you do hear many of the parables of 13. They should be familiar to the parable of the wheat and the tares, of course, the parable of the sower. I mean, that comes up and, and it's, these parables are preached upon. But what you do not hear is Jesus talk about why he, um, the, the purpose of the parables. Now, in in Mark, you have uh, the purpose of the parables are, are given in this short passage that goes from verse 10 through uh, verse 17. Uh, the disciples came and asked them, so you have the parable of the sower, and then uh, the way that Matthew it constructs this narrative, you have the parable of the sower, and then the disciples come and ask Jesus to explain it. It's like to explain the parable, Jesus explains the parable, and then and then they go on. So why do you use parables? Now, again, when we were when we are going through Mark's gospel, the parables for Mark are, um, in a sense, Jesus tells them uh, almost to almost to provoke unbelief. The parables are the parables of Mark's gospel. Of course, Mark doesn't have as many. He does have the parable of the sower. So that's a, clearly one of the the big biggies, if you will. That that. Um, that had, was that was remembered very early on, but uh, for Mark, the parables are told to provoke, almost provoke opposition and, and disbelief. For Matthew, um, in, in, I just want to show you the, the very subtle way that Matthew reshapes the purpose of, of a parable using the same, in many ways, the same words, but just a few little things really make put a nuance. For Matthew, why, in a sense, we get from why Matthew thought Jesus used the parables. In a sense, you know, you have kind of Mark's version, then you have Matthew. So you, you start in verse 10, then the disciples came and asked him, why do you speak to them, meaning the crowds, in parables? And again, this in the in by chapter 13, because of the opposition and rejection of Jesus, um, what in Mark is Mark uh, has the disciples and the crowds kind of together. That is, neither the disciples nor the crowds get it. Often in Mark, the disciples are just as much of an obstacle to Jesus as the crowds are. Um, 
in Matthew, at this point, you start, you have a division, and you really do see the disciples as one group set apart from the crowds, the them. Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, to you, meaning the disciples, it has been given to know, the, in some of your Bibles will say, the secrets of the kingdom, the Greek word there is mysterioi, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. By the way, that's the word that uh, the church used also for the sacraments in Greek, that they were mysteries of Christ. So to you has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to, to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. So far, so good in Mark. Matthew's tracking Mark, almost exactly. But then, Matthew remembers a, a characteristically Matthean move, which is a, we call it a fulfillment formula. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, so again, Mark or Matthew again and again will want to take passages that uh, from the prophets. His, Isaiah what is his favorite, and we, you know probably Jesus' favorite too. But anyway, so it's definitely Matthew's favorite, not Jesus. So Jesus says, gives Jesus himself gives the fulfillment uh, formula. You will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears. Now, there, Mark also uses this passage, not with a fulfillment formula, not with the, the typical Matthean, this happened to fulfill what the... Mark just quotes it. He just, he just puts it in there. But Matthew extends the quotation... Just one more verse from the Mark inversion, which, uh, which really does alter, or not, but it, it puts a, a spin on the meaning. The extra words that Matthew includes are, and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Right? So for the, the Mark inversion of the parables is in a sense, parables are simply to almost, they're, they're almost deliberately told by Jesus to say, hey, you know, you don't get it. You're not supposed to get it. You know, um, and it's the secret of the kingdom is that is that's you know is the the must secret of, of as we talked about through you know is the secret of the nonviolent kingdom, right? It's like and basically if you can't get suffering love, uh, you're not going to get any of this. So he he so, but for for Matthew, for Matthew, unbelief in a sense comes from a lack of commitment or trust, commitment to or trust in the symbolic world of the kingdom described in the parables themselves. So um, for, for Matthew, all these parables say the kingdom of heaven is like this, the kingdom of heaven is like this, the kingdom of heaven is like this. They're all, they're all parables of the kingdom, including the sower, the, kingdom, the parable of the sower. So in a sense, instead of, um, in a sense, parable first, unbelief second, which is the mark in, in sequence, it's really unbelief or lack of commitment to, again, the symbolic world that the parables are describing and therefore you can't understand it. So you can't understand because you, do, you, you, you don't believe in the first place, right? So you see just that subtle shift of how the parables function with the crowds. They're not since told by Jesus to, you know, get people mad at him, they, the people are mad at him because they have failed to embrace the world that the parables describe. That's, that's the Mathean kind of tweak on the experience of the crowds. Um, and it's, and you just, that little extension of the Isaiah passage just gives that little, and I would heal them. It's like Jesus was trying to, trying to do that. And of course, Mark has Jesus trying to do that too. But Mark has an edge. You know, Mark's presentation of his Jesus is like, 
here's the deal. Like, like, you know, I'm, you know, this, you know, and, and, uh, um, and he, and, you know, in many ways, in, if you remember from Mark, Matthew, or Mark's Jesus comes under, a, under attack from the Pharisees, like, immediately, to use Mark's word, right? You know, like at the end of chapter one, Jesus is already running up against Pharisees. In Matthew, it happens a little bit later. It's more gradual. Has the reality of what Jesus attempts to communicate through his teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, and now through the parables, becomes clear to those who are to those who are listening. The parables, the key theme of all of the parables of the kingdom itself. I mean, the, if you want to like, what what is the theme that joins them all? Is essentially humble beginnings. To overwhelming power. That's mm -hmm. the that's the thing. Must is you know the, the the mustard seed isn't in here, but it's but it's basically that's the economy of the parable. Is everything starts small, and then all of a sudden it's overwhelming abundance or power. So it's the way of understanding the the. So for Mark, the parable of the sower, the way that Mark structures the presentation of the parable of the sower. Is that the parable of the sower is about the is about believers and unbelievers? You know that basically you have people who hear what Jesus is saying and, and they reject it or they they come along for a little bit for the the you know they come along for the bread and then they leave, etc. For Matthew, the way that Matthew presents these parables and structures them is that the 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 parable of the sower is more about an interior. It, it becomes more every person. In a sense, for in the way that Matthew shapes this, every person is both fertile, rocky, weedy, and bird-eaten ground. Every person has it in them, and the drama of the gospel for Matthew is: which one will you allow to come forward and receive the seed? Which one, you know? And if you just give Jesus just a little bit of you. Just give him a little bit of your life. Give him a little, um, give me a little bit of your heart. Big things can happen. Abundance can happen. A hundredfold. That for Matthew is the meaning of the sower and the rest of the parables of the kingdom. It's about you know the merchant who goes and buy and sells everything he has. So he buys the one pearl. It's of great value, right? Mm -hmm. It's so he starts. So basically. The merchant beggars himself in order to have something of great value. It's, so he starts from, you know, from nothing to having everything. And so um, that's the economy. In a sense, that is the mystery of the kingdom. The mystery of the kingdom, the secret is, it starts small, but gets big. That's the mystery. Um, for Mark, the mystery is much more... Uh, raw in the sense that the mystery is the Messiah came and he suffered and died and then was victorious. That's now you, those are kind of the same thing, right? I mean, it's you know you, you start small, like die, dead, you know, and you and then you get big, i.e., risen from the dead. That's a you know that's a pretty big, but it's a subtle difference in how in what they think the most important part of Jesus's message is. And it, it just, it's just part of how they shape what they're saying. Um, so it's, uh, um, you know, the, also the crowd with this saying, with this extension of, um, of the verse in Isaiah, the crowd, instead of being condemned by Jesus for not understanding um, or for being in opposition to his mission, um, the crowd is pitied. If, if there's almost a, there's it's it's a it's a basically by concluding this way, it's almost a wistful conclusion. You know, if only, you know, if mm -hmm. only they would turn, I'd heal them. You know, but they gotta turn. You know, if they want to get healed. But if only they do it. You know, oh, you know, you're right there, kid. You know, it's like you know, it's like you're right there, kiddo. <laughs> didn't get didn't do it right. Didn't get it done. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's the difference in the Mathean presentation of Jesus vis-a-vis -vis the crowds. Okay. Um, and his, um, and the disciples. And so 
Then in verses 16 through 17, you have um, a, a, a word that the disciples in Mark never get. They get, they get a blessing <laughs> from Jesus. For, he's a, it's like the disciples just get hammered in Mark all the, all the way through the, the whole thing. In Matthew, blessed are your, but blessed, speaking to the disciples now. So I would turn, I would have turned and healed them, meaning the crowds. But blessed are your eyes, meaning the disciples' eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and hear what you hear, but did not hear it. The implication being that they are seeing and hearing. They're, you know. You're comprehending what I'm telling you, which in Mark, they, you know, that again, that's a theme in Mark. The disciples never get it, which again is part of Mark's project. I mean, Mark's, the challenge of Mark's presentation of the gospel is you can never pin this guy down. You don't get it unless you are willing to embrace the path of suffering love, mm -hmm. right? You, that's it. That's the only way. And Matthew it, you know, he's much more, he's like, Jesus is a rabbi, and you could be his best students, you know? Congratulations! Well done! You've come to the right class! Right? You know? The, that's what he said, blessed are you. It also is along the lines of, um, truly, I you know, when he says, truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous, the righteous, um, long to see what you see. Um, it's, uh, it, you can hear echoes of um, the, uh, Jesus' word on John the Baptist, you know, the, the, you know, he was the greatest prophet of Israel, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Basically, hey, if you're in on this, then you, in a sense, you have, you are um, receiving the culmination of Israel's history. This is where, it, this is where Israel's history, the prophets and the righteous, um, and, the, and it says, and righteous people, that doesn't mean morally excellent persons. <laughs> what the righteous mean are, it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a code, it's a euphemism, it would have been understood, is those who suffered at the hands of pagan oppressors, the righteous, those who refused to give up the faith, especially under the Greek occupation, back, you know, the, the epitome, you know, the epitome, you know, the epitome of occupation is the Greek occupation of the, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, you know, he tortured all those people, and you know, you have the story of Hanukkah and all that stuff. So that that the righteous are those who died for the faith, who refused to give up the faith, and say they were looking. Basically, they were looking to the victory you are now perceiving. So, um, which is interesting because the victory hasn't been won yet, that, and so. They're going to go back. They're going to, they're going to, you know, just like anybody who's had students, they, they have good days and bad days. So this was, <laughs> right, you know, sometimes, you know, so they, uh, you know, on this day, they got an A for the day. But, uh, you know, the F was coming, right? So like, they're, they're going to flunk out at the end uh, on Thursday night at about 2 to 3 a.m. Thursday. To, they're all going to, they're all going to, you know, you know, withdraw from the class. Um, <laughs> But Jesus will handle that on Sunday morning. Uh, so you know, he's gone. But uh, so, but even but Matthew is different in that you actually have this ray of hope for the disciples. You do have this little blessed are you who have seen, and uh, um, to you it has been granted by God uh, to have this. So again, the 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 passive voice is given that God is the author of what they have seen. Um, and so that gets um, underscored. Blessed are the eyes. Okay, so there's the um, and then in, and then the other thing that doesn't that doesn't get read is the which is also relate to parables is verses 34 through 35. So basically, Jesus starts telling some parables of the kingdom. Then he comes back to this later. Um, and again, Luke had to clean this up. Luke, Luke does not write this way. You know, Luke wants to organize it all and have it in a much more cleanly flowing narrative. But it says, Jesus in verse 34, Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Just in case you didn't get why he told things in parables before, when the disciples just asked him, Matthew's going to tell you again <laughs> in an editorial comment. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. That's not quite 
probably true, is it? But anyway, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, call it Semitic hyperbole, right? So it's, it's kind of like, he, he told them nothing without a prayer. Well, actually, we have a whole bunch of chapters where he actually says lots of stuff. But anyway, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. You know, fulfillment formula. I will open my mouth and to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. So, um, and it, it's interesting that, the, you know, in a sense, the lectionary tries to protect uh, Sunday morning churchgoers from a Jesus who is not always clear, who can be ambiguous, who can be hard to pin down. Evidently, they think, you know, it's just hard to take. Um, so uh, they, they never give that to you on a Sunday. They just give you the parable, right? And so dutiful preachers, that's what we have, and so we kind of will preach that parable. But again, it really takes kind of being able to stand back a little bit to, to see all the parables, which we don't have time on us. And, you know, we could read all of Matthew 13, right? If you want to know what that's like, just think like Palm Sunday, okay? It's like a long time, it's like, like a long reading. People in Western America or in, West, in the Western world, we can't take it. So uh, we can't read that much at one time. People will never pay attention. So you just take a little parable. Um, and so you have to deal with it in little chunks. But it's so important to understand what the gospel writers were up to as a whole, right? This would all be read not in the way that we read it, but typically in the communities to which these are written, they're, they're read all in a unit. Right? They'd, they'd be read in long chunks like this, where people could get more of that um, narrative understanding of the parables. Okay, so uh, the then basically you get a, a lot of, as I said, we read a lot of Matthew 13 on a Sunday. You get a lot of Matthew 14 and 15 through the Gospel of Mark. So basically, kind of Matthew's tracking along with Mark, and you hear these s stories and episodes in Mark's Gospel that we read on a Sunday. So that's not on her. So we're going to skip down to, again, a, a, a Matthean distinctive, which comes in chapter 17 at the um, at the uh, transfiguration so the transfiguration is uh, read to you in Luke's version and as and as and as denouement uh, is read to you in Luke's gospel but Matthew has a little text up in uh, verses 10 through 13 about uh, the coming of Elijah which is just an interesting little side note it's like, so basically you have uh, you have that wonderful, you know, he's on the mountain, he's transfigured, you've got the booze going on, you got this up, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then he, then he gives them this, the, he, he, the messianic secret, tell no one what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Um, and it's, it's great. Mark's, Mark's gospel has the disciples say, they they did they did keep the secret, but they wondered what all this raising. They don't, don't say what all this, but they wondered what the raising of the dead means. You know, like, you know this kind of, but that's my Texas. They wondered what all this all this raising of the dead stuff is. So again, Mark's disciples, so they they don't get it. They don't get it. Matthew's disciples, being good rabbinic students, ask him a question of biblical. So okay, Rabbi, help us understand. The disciples asked him, this is starting in verse 10, the disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He replied, Elijah is indeed coming and will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. So as a couple of like things about that this quintessentially Matthean that I've already you know I've already taught you right first of all the disciples are quick on the uptake why why is this so quick on why would the disciples be thinking about Elijah uh, that's it's not a rhetorical question if you remember the transfiguration story why would Elijah come up yeah the so where are they just seen Elijah. On the mountain. I mean, they just saw, right? They just saw him. So it's like they just saw Moses and Elijah. And so that's why he's, they're like, oh, wait, we just saw Elijah. 
Now we've been told to keep this a secret until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead, whatever that means. What they might have thought, the raised from the dead, their expectation, the expectation of Second Temple Judaism, was that the resurrection of the dead would happen when the kingdom came to Israel. That is, when God came to Israel, he would raise the righteous dead, and the pagans would be wiped out, right? And, or just sent to the cornfield, wherever it is they go, right? It's like, they, the pagans gone, we're here, back with our kingdom, back with all the righteous dead, and we live happily ever after with God himself, the footstool of his, te of, of his you know, the footstool is, his, is the temple, you know, right in the middle of, of, our, of our civilization. And so when they, the common expectation, kind of in the kind of legends and teachings that grew up in Second Temple Judaism, Elijah, because he had been taken up bodily into heaven in the chariot of fire, um, the idea is that he would come back down as the messenger of the coming kingdom and that the righteous dead would be coming right after him. Remember, Elijah opposed the wicked, you know, you know uh, uh, and Queen Jezebel, Ahab and Jezebel, you know, he opposed the, the and he opposed the Syrians, you know, he, like, he, he stood up to the enemies of Israel. So he becomes, Elijah becomes a figure of those who stood up against not only enemies foreign, but also enemies domestic. He stood up against that wicked king. <coughs> Excuse me, I had something in my head. So um, he, you know, so Elijah becomes a live symbol, very useful way of talking about when God comes, He's going to sort out not only the pagans but also those collaborating, sneaky, greedy little people who put themselves on the throne in the meantime, i.e., the half Jew Herod. You know, who thinks he can build a temple and, you know, that's all is forgiven. No, we'll take the temple and you're still going to hell, Herod. But anyway, that was a, so that was the attitude of, of Second Temple Judaism. Um, and so, uh, so Elijah is, is a major figure. So Elijah's going to come and then, the, so then, so the disciples, they've seen Elijah. Oh, great. Here we are on a mountain. We're here, you know, it's like kind of remember how, you know, Chairman Mao, he starts the movement in the countryside and he goes from there. It's like. We're in the Galilean countryside. We're with our people. We're going to, here's Elijah. There's the Messiah. We're going to form up the army and we're going to march south. Right? Right? That's, that's what's in their heads. It's like, oh, we saw the signs. We saw the signs. There's Elijah. But then he says, don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> well, you know, how are you supposed to have a revolution if you don't tell anybody? About it? <laughs> you know, it's just kind of, you know. And it's, that's the point. So why then do the scribes so that we must have missed the cue? That, so there must be some sort of difference in the interpretation of Elijah's role. Uh, Jesus, this is a classic move by Jesus. This is, you know, that Matthew brings forward. Whereas Jesus so often likes to change the ground of the discussion. Right? He doesn't, note how Jesus doesn't necessarily say, oh, the scribes are totally wrong. Elisha's with my father, and he ain't coming back. I'm the guy. He doesn't, he doesn't get into, since Jesus doesn't get into the substance of the debate. He does that again and again and again. When he tells it, when he responds with a, he responds with a parable, or he responds, he, Jesus will consistently ignore the content and go straight to, like, what the real issue is. You know, he, he always, he, Jesus takes, oh, you know, you see him taking the initiative to, to set up the grounds of the discussion. So he doesn't go after it. He doesn't say, oh, the scribes are wrong. He doesn't do any of that. He says, Elijah is indeed coming. Oh, you bet. Absolutely. Right? And they did to Elijah everything they wanted to do. And, they, oh, okay. John, it's John the Baptist. So, so that, you know, he basically, yes, Eli, you know, I'm not going to argue with the scribes about whether or not Elijah is. I'm saying the kingdom is on its way. And how do you know? Because the righteous are suffering. That, that much you can see. And the, and the kingdom that he's about to bring, the kingdom is to be restored. This does not mean, <clears throat> what this, what this, the kingdom being restored does not mean what Second Temple Judaism thought it would mean. That is, pagans gone, you know, you know. 
It doesn't mean, and it doesn't mean everything's going to turn out okay. Remember, the cross is still ahead of Jesus. He says, but he's saying the kingdom is, is being restored. He's going to, he's coming and will restore all things. But in a sense, for Jesus here, the, what he's suggesting in this discussion, in this kind of very cryptic discussion of Elijah and his role and relating him to John the Baptist, is that restoration equals, in a sense, a reorientation, a renewal of purpose and power, including how we define the power of the kingdom itself. The power of the kingdom will not be displayed in a military victory or the wiping out. You know, it's like, it's, in a sense, you know, like the, if you, I don't say spoiler alert, but if you've seen the Avengers movie, but basically you, you, you snap the fingers and everybody kind of turns into dust. That's kind of what the Jews thought might happen immersively to the Gentiles. That was the mer that, that, that God would just kind of snap his fingers and, and all the pagans would just kind of disappear. You know, they didn't necessarily need to see them torture, you know, or, to, you know, they just had to be gone. They just had to go away, right? But that's not the, the power of the kingdom that Jesus is bringing. The power of Jesus is, in a sense, what Jesus is restoring through his death and resurrection is the possibility of living without fear hatred, and the violence that those things bring. The possibility of living without fear and hatred and the violence that comes from those two things. Mm -hmm. The cost, the cost of this alternative lifestyle, if you will, the cost of the kingdom breaking out in small things has already, Jesus is pointing, has already been paid by John the Baptist and will then be fully paid by myself using the Son of Man, raised from the dead. Son of Man always, as I've said again and again, Son of Man equals cross. Just think, Jesus on cross. Whenever you hear Jesus refer to himself that way, he's speaking of his, his suffering death. So the, the renewal that is about to come forth, again, is a renewal where we can imagine the possibility of living in a freedom from fear and, and hatred, and the desire to wipe out all the pagans and all the wicked within Israel itself is revealed to be another form of the same slavery. It's just more of the same. Um, and that that is what has the, is the, the root hatred of the other, the root fear of death. And everything we do to manage that and negotiate with to make the world turn as we know it has been shown to be the lie that it is and overcome. So in a sense, what's being restored is the truth about how things are supposed to work, the truth about God's will for human life. That's what's restored. Um, that is the kingdom. And that this kingdom is going to break out in small ways. And, and, and we, that means you and me, people. I mean, unless you really... Shh. We're supposed to be small, right? We're gonna die. It's like, I mean, that's the thing. It's like we are we are not immortals, right? So when the kingdom can break out in you, I'm asking you, it's like it's kind of my sermon last week about the Good Samaritan. It's like recognize that you're on the you're on, supposed to be living on the small side, right? Thinking of yourself that way. Not as great person on the mountain. Rather, you are the small thing. You're the mustard seed. The kingdom is growing through you, but that through the difference you make as you engage in that path of suffering love, as you engage in that alternative way of living, that's what makes the big difference that that reverberates through the creation itself. Okay, so let me see. I've got five minutes or so. Oh, yeah, okay, that's just enough time to do this one. Okay, so the next one is, and this is a... This is Matthew 17, uh, uh, so you skip, we hear a lot of 16, 17, 24 through 27, it's the end of that chapter, and it's really a delightful, it's only in Matthew, it's not heard on Sunday, so it's a Matthean specialty, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and you may have heard it in Sunday school, but it is a very strange episode, I'll just tell you right, that is strange, and that's why, again, we protect Sunday Christians from strange things. I think we should, maybe I should call it like strange things. That's what I should call this uh, class. So this is verse 24. When they reached Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and said, 
does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, yes, he does. And when he came home, Jesus spoke of it first, asking, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tribute? From their children or from others? When Peter said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the children are free. However, so that we do not give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook. Take the first fish that comes up. And when you open his mouth, you will find a coin. Take that and give it to them for you and me. That's weird. That's, that's, I think that is, it's just weird. You know, it's kind of like it's like when he, you know, kind of when Jesus goes like, ta and in the mud, and you know, I mean, it's like if, if for us, it's like, what's going on? You know, I don't want, you know, you know, some of the songs that you know, as I, like we make fun of some of the contemporary Christian songs. You know, and it's not so much these days, but back more of the ones that were in the late 80s and early 90s, the kind of the Jesus is my boyfriend, kind of, and I'm getting a back rub from Jesus, he loves me, and he looks into my eyes, and it's like, whoa, you know, <laughs> like, so, you know, like, I don't want Jesus to smear me with mud, I don't want that, you know, wet willy, you know, like, you know, so this is like, so this is on this scale of like, whoa, and it really is, in my district, a delightful and evocative story. It is in the it is in the the kind of under the heading of the, Jesus will do this much more confrontationally and publicly at the temple around paying taxes to Caesar. Same sort of thing, right? Same sort of kind of. So how do we relate? Kind of is the question uh, here is how do we relate to to secular authority, right? So we okay we got this kingdom thing going on. And then there are people who ain't in the kingdom life, right? And they're mm -hmm. kind of running the world. Mm -hmm. And we have to live in their world, even as we live in the kingdom. So how do we negotiate that boundary? When do we take a stand? You know, when do we... It's a really... It's a, if, so if you really look at what is being handled by this episode, it's an important issue for Christians. To for perennial. And in a sense, when Christians stop asking this, that sort of question, that's when you know Christianity is dead as a moral witness in a culture. When Christians stop asking, how is it that we're supposed to relate? When, whenever, I, I would say, this is like, this is a pot of historical postulate from Father Rob, you take this to the bank, that when, it, when the church or a culture has stopped asking the question, it's like the, the Christian moral witness has been rendered inert, right? When Christians just like, oh, we got that figured out, you know? Okay, I get it, right? <laughs> you know, so as long as this is a live issue, we can use this story. It's a parabolic question that Jesus asked. So, so, and again, it's just so classic Jesus. That's the thing. I mean, it's really rooted in this is the Jesus we know. He does. Jesus does weird stuff. He does. He does stuff that we as modern Americans find strange. Thanks be to God, right? <laughs> I mean, golly. I mean, if you want an American, you go listen to Justin Bieber. I don't know, that's it. You get him your savior. But Jesus does stuff that modern Americans don't get, don't like, don't connect with. Okay? Because he's not a modern American. <laughs> he's on the Lord of history. Okay. So you have this parabolic question about kings and their descendants. You know, you might, you know, to update it, you might say, you know, does the Queen of England and, you know, Harry... And, you know, what, what not? Do they pay taxes? No, they don't. The royal family don't pay taxes. The British people pay taxes for them. Mm -hmm. they, no, they don't. Do they pay taxes? Yeah, like, all right. Well, they didn't used to. It it's, it's a constitutional monarchy. Yeah. Back in the good old days, they didn't pay taxes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. In a, in a, you know, in, in a better age. That's right. No. So back in the, so, you know, the, the idea here is that, you know, if you are the monarch and everybody belongs to you, basically, you get everything charge taxes to your children. Um, and again, we live in a world where, you know, you, our children pay rent to us when they come home for the summer, but anyway. Um, but, uh, but uh, so it's this, this great parabolic question to get at. So in a sense, first of all, Jesus is trying to get Peter to, to answer the question, um, Who's, whose child are you? You know, which kingdom do you belong in, Peter? And Peter's like, oh, yours, Jesus. You know, I was like, okay, good. Okay, that's a good start. So First, the question, for the, the first question you have to answer the, in this parable is, to which family do I belong? Do I belong to the royal family or to those who are taxed by the world? Right? Which family do I belong to? Again, the royal family is open to all, you know, who come to it. But, I mean, you've got to sign up for it, too. I mean, 
But are you, which, you know, who, who are, whose are you? Whose are you? To whom do you belong? You belong to Caesar, by whatever name he goes by, in every time and place? Or do you belong to Jesus Messiah? Do you belong to the king, his family? So Peter answers, answers correctly. It's interesting, this is also classic Peter, in that Peter gives an answer, and it's by no means clear that Jesus <coughs> did. In fact, it, it suggests that he didn't. But Peter, always <laughs> eager to be a spokesman for the movement, you know, says, oh yeah, we did, we, you bet we pay that tax. And then, and then he comes home, and he just, I just, it's just, I just have to, I imagine, you know, all this is left out in the detail, but I have to imagine, it's like, Jesus knows what happened in Capernaum, you know, and Peter, Let's talk. Okay, so, so, so well, you know, he takes him aside because it says Jesus talked about it first. Like as soon as Peter comes in, hey Peter, I got something we need to talk about. Um, but you know, so then you have a parabolic, what we call a parabolic nature miracle, right? So if you're, I mean, if you're okay with multiplication of loaves, if you're okay with a miraculous draft of fish. If you're okay with wind and water being calm at his command, then a coin in the mouth of a fish isn't a big thing. You know, don't strain out a gnat and swallow a camel later, right? It's, you know, if Jesus can do that stuff, he can do this. It's easy enough for Jesus to put a shekel in the mouth of a bass. So, uh, you know, that can happen. Because he can make as many bass as he wants, right? He's the Lord. And as he dis displays in several incidents, but the parabolic nature miracle is something that then, in a, in a sense, give this testimony so that you do not give offense. The word is scandal. So you do not scandalize them, meaning the people who are, go ahead and pay the tax. What an interesting and agonizingly ambiguous response from Jesus. <laughs> you know, it really is a, 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 a tough, we have to, in other words, to follow Jesus, you really got to work on this stuff. You have to think, what does it mean to take up your cross? What does it mean to, you know, be willing to suffer for the truth, etc.? And then when, when are times when you just, just go find a fish and pay it off, for Pete's sake. Just give them the shekel and go about your life. Let them do their, let them do them and you do you. And the difficulty of pulling those two things apart is why following is that's what you have denominations, we have historical epochs. I mean, it's it's really hard. It's really hard. And this is in a sense, I was just thinking about this as um, and this is my last point. The as I was driving the car actually, Thursday or Wednesday, I have these sorts of thoughts when I drive around town at a stoplight. But I say, you know, the the difference between a religion based on negative observance, oh I know, it was because something we talked about on uh, on, on Thursday. Um, about the difference between a negative obedience and a positive obedience. That is a negative obedience, meaning you successfully don't do the things you're prohibited from doing. Right? In a sense, a, a democratic secular state is based on negative obedience. Just don't hurt anybody. Don't steal. You know, don't, don't, you know, basically, and, and if you don't do these prohibited things, you live your life. You get to do whatever you want to do. And that's the whole area of things I, where I'm the boss of me. Right? And you're not the boss of me. So you have religion, and essentially, both Judaism and Islam are any religion that's based on a legal code has its has its charter, in a sense, has its constitutional charter, is going to be based on a negative observance. And it's in a sense easier to get it. Like, in a sense, it's easier to agree on what we don't do than on what we ought to do. Well, we're, I mean, it's, you probably, you, you, it's easier to get to something, well, we're not going to do that with some, you know, you can probably agree on things we're not going to do versus what is it that we ought to be doing? Yeah. Well, then it's much, that's a positive observant, and it's, it's a positive obedience where you have to kind of come out from, you have to move off the dime mm -hmm. and do something, right, to, and, and the, and the, the Jesus faith, what he's calling, especially I'm riffing off the, the, his confrontation with the Pharisees and Pharisaic religion in Matthew, but says, Jesus said, great, you, you managed not to kill anybody and you managed not to have an affair. Super. Not, you know, good for you. But there's something else. Right? There's something else that God is looking for other than, you know, ch you know coloring in between the lines. He, it's called loving your neighbor, right? As yourself. Well, what does that mean? 
figure it out. By the way, but it's not like figure it out, I'm leaving the classroom, I'm not coming back, you know, and send in your answers, and then I'll, and then I'll correct them, and if you fail, you fail. It's, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to help you. So there is a helper, there is a counselor who will lead us in all truth, and he gives us a community in which we can discern this. That's so important that we're not left to find the answers on our own. In fact, to try to do it on our own by ourselves, it's impossible to find the answer. That the Holy Spirit works in community and works as a group, that positive obedience, because it, for Christians it has to relate to being in relationship with another, it is by its very nature a group project. Native, ne negative obedience, you can do all by your lonesome. You can do all by yourself. You can not break a law, right? But in order to do for other, you have to, it's a group project, right? So in a sense, I think that, that um, Jesus is, you know, this is so difficult to figure out what does it mean to fish for a, you know, to go cast a line for a fish with a shekel in its mouth, is, is trying to figure out what is it that we can, in a sense, work with the state or with non-kingdom realities and which ones we have to challenge. And uh, I'd be remiss if I tried to answer that question for you. So I will go into the name. I'll see you all next week. Blessings, honey. See you next week. Bye.